just a little warning. I'm a little hoarse today, so uh, we'll see if I need to cut short. I'm not sure what's going on, um, but hopefully that won't be a problem. Um, so welcome back everyone to uh, the Web APIs with our book club. For anyone watching online uh, on YouTube, this club is um, helping me write a book. So uh, we have some like starts and stops and you may see uh, some material that you've already watched. I I've seen that there are quite a few vi uh, viewers on YouTube, which is interesting. So uh, welcome and please you know, join us at dslc.io uh, if you would like to participate. All right, so today, I want to talk a little bit about kind of where things stand and then go into um, kind of the chapter that made me <laughs> rewrite a bunch of things because I wasn't happy with where it landed. Uh, and then we'll see if we have time to go into the, the brand new chapter. All right. So let me make sure that you're seeing what I think you're seeing. Yes. Okay. So this is the, the index basically of the, the book club version of the book or the table of contents rather. Um, and, you know, we have seen uh, an introduction which has changed a bit since we saw it. Um, and then a couple of weeks ago, or I guess uh, like before the, before the break, we went through a, a new kind of first chapter where we used just JSON light to access the API or access APIs. Uh, last week, um, we talked about Tiblify. So, sorry, intro, how can I get started? Is that JSON light chapter? How can I quickly parse API responses was um, about Tiblify and how you can use Tiblify and the open API spec mm -hmm. to uh, uh, quickly parse. Um, you might now, yeah, you might want to mute Jim or not, it's up to you. <laughs> um, and then, so today, the first thing we want to talk about is this chapter, how can I more easily access APIs from R? This was formerly, how can I access APIs from R, I think, but we've already seen a couple ways to do that. So I focused this on just hit or two. All right, so our focus today is going to be on using API docs to explore available endpoints in an API. Um, we're going to fetch data from an API with hitter two, and we're gonna build a hitter two request piece by piece. So this is just a subset of that chapter that we looked at before. I realized I have not updated this uh, list of packages used in the chapter, so I can't tell you whether or not those packages will actually be used and we'll see as we go. All right, so um, I don't know if this would actually be in the final version of this, but I wanted to go over a little bit where we've been, what we have what we will have seen at this point because we've had starts and stops. All right, so uh, looking first at, you know, what can we do? Um, we can access APIs that can be accessed in a web browser. So anything that we can load as a web page, we can load from R uh, as long as we don't need to log into it. Um, we can uh, copy paste or manually build those URLs for the APIs that we're working with. Um, we can uh, pass an authentication key as part of a URL. So we, we've seen how to pass parameters in a URL. So we could, if, if that's all we need to do, we could do that. Um, we can fetch JSON data with JSON Lite. Um, so we can, you know, a lot of APIs we can access with just JSON Lite. Uh, we may or may not have seen YAML. Uh, that's still, I'm still deciding exactly where that lands, but there's the YAML package that we can use to fetch YAML data. It's rarer from an API, but it's not unheard of. So, you know, there's a fair amount that we can do, um, but there are obviously things we can't do yet. So what can't we do yet? We can't access APIs that can't be accessed or at least can't be easily accessed in a web browser. Um, there are technically nine types of requests that you can make using uh, the standard that we'll talk about in a little bit. And we can do one of them so far. So uh, there's 
a lot that we can't do. That said, fetching data is usually the one that we can do, the get type of access. So it's not too bad. Um, we can't build API requests systematically. Like we could do some pastes or things like that, but we don't have a nice clean way to sort through and build an API request. We've seen it, but we haven't, we won't have seen it <laughs> at this point in the book. Uh, and we can't access APIs that require like actual authentication that you have to log into them. Um, a lot of APIs use something called OAuth that can be really confusing and we haven't gone through that yet. So we'll have to do that at some point. Um, we haven't done anything to fetch other types of data like raw text or images or videos. Um, you know, we've only worked with JSON and YAML. Um, let's see. So yeah, the endpoints we've hit haven't actually had any arguments on them. So we haven't done anything there, you know, anything with that. So we haven't built any API requests systematically. Um, and technically, you know, you could download an image with just download file and base R, but um, each, if you use download file, you're not going to really parse the return and do anything with it. Um, and yeah, there are other things that we don't know how to do yet, but it would be more confusing to list them than to not. So we'll get to those other things once we know the, enough to see that we want to do, to do them. Um, but the, the thing I want you to know is that uh, we will be using Hitter 2 to deal with all of these other things. So it makes them all as easy as they can be, which doesn't always mean easy, but it means not as much of a mess as it would be otherwise. So, all right. Um, how can we learn about an API, about the things that an API can do? My motivating example for the next, uh, basically for most of this chapter and the in pieces of the next chapter is this open FEC API. Um, it is the Federal Election Commission API. Uh, and, you know, we've seen it a couple of times. They have this uh, site. Um, it tells you a little bit about like how to get started, how to request an API key, which we won't need for what we're going to do. But if you want to play around with it, you might want to do that. Um, that's what this form is about. But if you don't have the your own API key, they give you this demo key that we can use. And we'll see how to, we can just throw that into our requests uh, and use things. But the other thing that is happening here is that um, the API or this documentation shows us a list of all these things that it can do. And so we could just navigate through here. There's this candid candidate category and it shows these different options, all of these get commands. These are what is called endpoints. And that just means like a URL that you are landing on in order to do something. Um, all right, we'll go back to the slides before digging into that too much more. So we have, uh, like I said, the documentation is usually describing these endpoints. It'll also do other things, but at a minimum, it's usually gonna describe the endpoints. Uh, an endpoint is a URL for a specific API function. So it's kind of like if you were calling a function, you would hit this endpoint, just like you're calling a fun function. And one of those functions that we saw right at the top there was to get candidates. So, the example I want to do is let's look at 2020 presidential candidates. Um, and I can't remember if I updated this title after updating some uh, <laughs> some things. So we'll see if this makes sense. All right. So we're going to focus on this candidates endpoint. And again, if we flip over, it's right there. Candidates endpoint. It tells us it's going to allow us to fetch basic information about candidates and use parameters to filter results to the candidates you're looking for. Uh, yada, yada, yada. All right, um, and we can just load up. This is the actual endpoint. Um, and you might see in the URL, I'm cheating because I downloaded it. I didn't want this whole thing to break if uh, their site went down. And so I have a local copy of it just for safety. Um, and so that's what we're looking at here. But this is the actual, this is the result. Like if we hit this endpoint, this is what it sends back. You can see um, that it is JSON and so, uh, you know, we'll be working with that. <laughs> exactly, as Kevin pointed out, <laughs> we're a government shutdown. I don't want my slides to break. So, 
All right. Um, and let's go back to the slides. Uh, just looking at, uh, you know, what it is, if, if, you know, what we've seen before, we could do JSON light read JSON and just plug that URL in and we would be able to get, uh, the, uh, that result and tiblify it. And I, I did some selecting here in head just to see a little piece of the result because, uh, there's quite a bit more that comes back, but so. You know, we can do the basics here. Um, but, you know, what if we wanted a different year or we wanted to look at a different office or we wanted to use any of the other 20 or so parameters that they show us here that we can use? Any one of those that we want to do, we would have to kind of start over and like build that URL by hand. And that is why there is the package hitter two. So um, we uh, will dig into a little bit about why it's called Hitter2 uh, in a little bit. And I think I had mentioned before that I learned that it's called Hitter2 when they put out this uh, logo for it. I used to always pronounce it H-T-T-R-2 and then realized, oh, it's, it's a hitter. And that's anyway. So Hitter2 is how it is formally pronounced. All right. And so... Um, We'll go through this. And again, we have done this before, but I, I feel like it probably makes more sense now. So I'm only not gonna burn through these too fast. If uh, people are bored, let me know and we can move a little faster. Um, so, okay, uh, what do hitter two calls look like? Um, they are pipe-based API calls throughout the book. Um, I'm using the base R pipe that came out a couple of versions of R ago. Um, and so whenever you see this, sorry, should be showing you the actual slide. All right. Uh, whenever you see this symbol, that is the base R pipe. And, um, that means, and then, so do this thing. And then I'll, I'll be putting that into the intro. So I really should cut the, out of the notes at this point. Um, but okay. Hitter two calls, they generally involve a request. So, uh, oops, a request. Um, that maybe you put some updates on some some stipulations, um, and then you perform that request, and then you parse the response. You do something with the response. Um, here we're hitting this free open API uh, from the Federal Elections Commission, and we're building this request piecewise. So again, you know, we make the we take the request. We call a bunch of functions that we'll talk about in a minute, um, perform the request, which is uh, we'll go into in more detail in the next chapter. Uh, this is where you actually hit the server. So cool. And then we parse the response. Now, when you do rest body JSON, what that's actually doing is calling JSON Lite read, uh, from JSON, um, just like what we've seen previously. So that piece is uh, something we've known about, but we'll dig a lot more into that into what is currently chapter seven, um, specifically if we want to do something other than JSON. All right. Um, and this is, you know, when I pulled up the response, it's the same thing that we get from uh, JSON Lite. So a minute ago, we called it, uh, I go back here, oops, uh, we created this object, OpenFTC response, which is what I just read from JSON. And if we do this actual response, we can see that candidates and that response are exactly the same thing. And that's because this rest body JSON under the hood is actually uh, using JSON Lite, which, um, you know, might be begging the question. So okay, then why? <laughs> this is a lot more code than that other code. Why are we doing this? Well, hopefully I'll be able to convince you that this is easier in the long run. All right. So first, why hitter two? Why is it called hitter two? Uh, the HTT part is from HTTP, the uh, hypertext transfer pr protocol. You probably have seen that in at the start of URLs, either HTTP or HTTPS, the S is for secure. 
Um, hypertext part, that just means web content. Uh, originally, that meant uh, text and links. That's what hypertext meant. And then, you know, related term is HTML, hypertext markup language, which is what web, page, web pages are written in. Uh, but now it really means like anything. It means data, it means images, videos, um, you know, chat uh, conversations and all kinds of whatever, all kinds of different things. But it still means just web content. Transfer, just meaning the exchange. So web content moving. And then protocol, meaning rules. And so uh, all in all, it's rules for exchanging web content. Um, and then the two, I, I had a whole bunch of stuff in the first ver version of this, but the two is just there because uh, he, he, sorry, uh, he rewrote the package for piping. Um, if you want a whole history, I'll probably have like an, a, a footnote about that, but it's just, this is the modern version of the package and that's why it's two. Um, all right. So how do we use it? Let's go into this in a little bit more detail. So imagine um, you're working with an API, like this FEC API. Uh, that's something that you'll often do, that you're going to be working with the same API for a while, not just making a single call. Um, and we're going to uh, go through the like specifics of functions in a minute. But first, let's just kind of look at why it's useful to have these separate pieces. So the rec functions all return hitter to request objects. And what that means is, uh, oh, and sorry, and all of them other than request, like request builds a hitter to request object. All the other ones, their first argument is a hitter to request object. And they just add something onto that. So like we can make this rec FEC auth by taking this original request that we made putting it into rec URL query and adding this query parameter onto our request. And so it just adds this on to the existing request. Or we can uh, take that thing and add on a piece of the path where we say, okay, we want the candidates piece of the, the query. And we just take that rec FEC auth and we add the candidates piece. Um, and we can take the candidates piece and add on this office query. And so even though we had this other uh, rec URL query before, we can add another piece of the query on. Um, so all of these things together, you know, let us uh, build little sub pieces that we can reuse. Um, and so for example, if we wanna get presidential candidates from 2024, we can take that, that president thing, president object, uh, president request rather, and just add an election year onto it and then perform it and uh, parse the body. Um, if we wanna get the 2022, um, like all the candidates from 2022, we can take just that rec candidates piece and add on the year 2022 and perform it and get the, um, the body, the, the response. If we wanna hit a totally different endpoint, we can just, go with that original rec FEC auth. We've got the authorization that we share, but we just add on a different endpoint, a different, this calendar dates uh, endpoint. And so it makes it uh, much easier when you're reusing things that it it like just adds on pieces uh, as you go. And you'll find that, you know, as we work through things, uh, we'll be doing this kind of concept a lot. All right. So now let's actually build some hitter two requests. And here is where um, we'll go through all the pieces. And this is where I'm gonna try to move a little fast through these because I did exactly this before. And it's um, kind of just like a slow walk through the documentation. So uh, let me know if you really, if you need me to slow down, but we have the previous videos for that. And so, you know, again, request and rec path append, um, you take the request and then uh, sorry, you can take the request that is the full URL where we've got you know, API openfpc.gov v1 candidates. Re request is fine taking that. 
but it's cleaner and more reusable if we break that up. So we can take the rec FEC as just like the core reused piece of the request. And then if we want to do candidates, we just add candidates onto that core reused piece. Um, and if we see the URL that we built there, um, and so, and it ends up being the same thing. Um, yeah, so it's exactly, so making functions out of it is much easier with hitter two than um, even with the older hitter, it was hard to make functions that did these things. Um, and it's much easier for like, if you're doing a kind of step-by-step -step process, you where we're going to add the candidates and then we're going to add like the um, funding information from, from the FEC endpoint. And so we can use that same building block that we used before. All right. Um, just a, a kind of an aside, there's this rec URL path, URL path and there are legitimate uses for it, but um, most of the time you don't want that. You want the rec URL path append. So if we look at rec FEC and we just rec URL path to candidates, and it's kind of hard to see, but it has dropped the V1 because it uh, rec URL path totally replaces the path and the V1 counts as part of the path. Um, just wanted to give that caveat. Rec URL, URL query. So with the query is, um, and I realized I need to add a bullet that the path is everything after this slash. So this is the, uh, I, I cut a slide and then forgot to add some points, but you know, this is like the, the protocol. This is the, the root. And then the path is anything after the root um, or the base, I guess, base URL or root, they call that. Um, so again, technically V1 is part of the path, but usually when we're working with hitter two, we're going to want to append onto that, you know, this would be our base. And then we add candidates onto that. Uh, the query is everything after the question mark. So it'll usually be question mark and then name value pairs, API key equals demo key and office equals P and any other parameters that we want to add. But again, we're using hitter two, so we don't really have to remember how do you string those together? Well, it just strings them together. So we can take rec candidates and we just say API key equals demo key, office equals P. We can put whatever arguments we want into here and it will um, add them on. And a nice thing that we can do is we can add those query parameter pieces like even before we add a path. So if we have rec FEC or if we have this rec FEC, which is just the, the core, core request, we can add our API key onto it because we're going to yeah, be adding that to every single request we make. And then we can take that thing that has the API key added onto it and add candidates, or we can add uh, you know, the, the office. Um, and doing that, it still is um, the identical to what we started with. Um, so yeah. Gabby asked, how do we know what other query parameters exist? The, uh, for an individual endpoint, almost always, you're going to just want to look at the help. And I can't remember. Yeah, let's go a little bit larger. Oops. Um, so this is that particular candidate's endpoint, and it will list all the parameters that are available. And um, we'll talk about the pagination in a little bit, but this is, you know, this has many, many parameters in this case. Most APIs, I mean, it depends what you're doing, but this one has a lot of parameters. Uh, and so it's actually part of probably why I chose it is it's one that has a lot of options to work through. Um, all right. So hopefully that answers the question. All right. Uh, there is this dot multi argument on rec URL, URL query. Um, if we look at it, we can see like rec candidates. If we just say office, um, sorry, Rick URL query, if we say office is both house and Senate, you know, we wanna say both the house and Senate, by default, it's gonna throw an error. It's telling us uh, that um, everything that you put into Rec URL query has to be length one because in a URL, you know, what would you do if I give you two things to go here? You need to tell it what you need to do. And that's what this dot multi argument is for. So dot multi can take various arguments or various specific values. So if you give it pipe uh, and you give it two, it'll 
with multi as pipe, it separates those two by a pipe. If you say multi as comma, it'll separate those two by a comma. Or if you say explode, it'll just add the argument twice. Um, a lot of times adding them twice, uh, either the API is gonna freak out or it's only gonna accept the first one or the second one. And so that's why it doesn't do that by default. It makes you go read the documentation and uh, it doesn't actually say right here in the documentation, but if you go into the um, open API spec, which I guess I should include at this point, it does specifically say, hey, you want to explode here. And so uh, you just have to know, you know, you'll, a lot of times what you'll have to do is experiment. Like if you know, you know, you, we can see here, um, kind of see that it's it's an array it's expecting more than one thing um and so okay it's expecting more than one thing but how do we tell it more than one thing well we'll have to experiment a little bit to find out sometimes and again um either in a new version of this or in a later chapter we will be able to see that in the document or in the specification it often has the details about that but sometimes it doesn't sometimes you just have to experiment all right, um, and that is now where I stopped. That's right, I used to have a whole lot more in this chapter, but it went all over the place. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if these numbers are, yeah, these aren't actually 100% um, right now, but uh, it's pretty close. So chapter four, that's where we are. Uh, and then chapter five, how can I get a lot of data from an API? That is true, that is what we're gonna talk about um, a little bit today. I'm just going to start that chapter, but we're probably going to not finish. Um, it originally was going to cover a lot more about that, um, but the, it got too big. And so it, it, I split it up. It's, it's going to be just focusing on the getting a lot of data because that's something probably you want to do if you're working in R. Um, Chapter six, we will finally go into authentication. I, I skipped it again because we do have plenty of APIs that don't need authentication. Um, and a lot of APIs just need you to send the API key as a parameter. So if you can work with parameters, you can usually do that. Um, and then chapter seven, uh, it, the ch title's probably not true anymore, but this is gonna be more about um, things other than JSON. So working with uh, images and working with uh, different types of text. And then um, chapter eight, I think it's still chapter eight, is how to do other things. So right now, like I said, there are those nine things that uh, you can do with HTTP requests, HTTP methods. We can only do get, but as you can see, like um, if I collapse this back down, uh, this is what a lot of APIs are going to look at like where, oh no, we can only do get, what are we gonna do? Oh, just every single thing in this endpoint we can do. Uh, where you need the other ones is if you're able to like manipulate the data, send data back, that's where, what we'll learn in that that later chapter. Um, all right, and then, yeah, so, the different types, so Kevin commented on the, like a comma separated, that this office equals H comma S. Um, they all, like depending what you're doing or, or the, you know, the pipe separated looks like H or S, which kind of is what it means. Um, it's, they're all like, they can mean different things. I actually have an example um, that I don't, I don't think I'm ever going to go into, but it has, I found an example where H comma, or the equivalent of H comma S means a different thing than H pipe S. Um, and I think they might even also accept like office equals H and office equals S. So they split out, each one of those has a meaning in one, end, one endpoint. And so that's where, you know, you would definitely want to add it one piece at a time and say, okay, for this case, I want to use dot multi of, of pipe because I mean, or versus, this one has to have both of those values or something like that. Um, so yeah, that is something every API, like even when there are standards and you know there are things that there are standards about, but API developers often uh, like reinvent the wheel. <laughs> uh, 
quite a bit actually. And so, um, sorry, I realized I wasn't showing this. Um, yes, so like this syntax here, the reason that this is an argument that you have to give to hitter two and that it did, I, this argument didn't even exist until the final 1.0 release of hitter two is that it, there isn't a standard. Um, and so you used to have to kind of just do it yourself outside of the API uh, or outside of hitter two. You would, you know, put those pipes in yourself, for example. Uh, but there are enough standards. Um, that or there are enough standards that enough things that are use, reused that he added these options. Um, most APIs will tell you um, at least this much about like what are the arguments and usually what they'll expect. But you know, if we look at the FPC one, it doesn't tell you in the actual documentation um, how to separate these that it should be, you know, the available available values are HSP and that you should send them as separate pieces. Um, so, right, <laughs> like, unfortunately, many don't and you have to uh, do a little bit of experimentation. This is where I'm probably gonna have to add a, a, a separate open API um, chapter because the, if you dig into the specification of the API, a lot of times there's stuff there that doesn't make it into the documentation. And this is one of those things that for, for whatever reason, they didn't choose to show it in the documentation, but they have it in the description of the API. Um, and so that is useful or that would be useful to show. All right, I'm going to close this up. Like I said, let's go ahead and do a little bit on the the actual new chapter. Um, I think everything that's in this chapter, we have not gone through uh, even in passing before. So this will be more fun. Um, all right. So this new chapter, how can I get a lot of data from an API? Um, We'll see how far we get. So the, our learning objectives today are to be able to find information about pagination in API docs and descriptions. Um, and we'll talk about, I guess, a little bit to go into that about what pagination means. Um, we're gonna learn a little bit about how to retry API requests respectfully. Um, Cause if we're trying to get a lot of pages of data, we're gonna be sliming on an API endpoint a little bit. And we need to learn how to do that without uh, getting booted from ever using that API again. So we're going to do a little bit on that. Uh, we're going to retrieve multiple pages of data from an API. That's the whole, whole goal here. And then we're going to take that multiple pages that we received and process it. Um, I only have hitter two in the used packages here. I can't remember. I probably use Tiblify, um, but we'll get into that when we get into it. <laughs> now I'll have to re-update uh, these lists. All right. So first, this whole chapter is about pagination. What the heck is pagination? So um, network traffic. Uh, so like actually sending things in between computers is relatively speaking slow and expensive. Um, and if you send a giant, just a single giant result, all, well, as it turns out, all a uh, couple hundred, I think, or maybe even a couple thousand people who ran for president in 2020, you send that all, the bigger the transfer is, the more the chances that it's not going to all make it. To the other end, and then you have to send it all again. And so uh, a lot of times APIs limit how much they will send to you in one response. They'll say, no, we're only going to send you 20 candidates at a time. And so that was the secret thing I wasn't showing you in the last chapter is we were actually only getting 20 candidates, even though there are a whole bunch more, because they were only selling, sending us 20 and they, they won't send you more than 20 in one request. Um, and then just, I, I 
you know, an important piece of information that I probably should put at the top here is that uh, one set of results is called a page a lot, most of the time. So when we're talking about pagination, we're saying splitting things up into pages. There are lots of different ways that things do this. So kind of like the one of the most basic is um, what you might call an offset strategy where they give you a page parameter. Um, so OpenFEC is an example of that. I guess I will open that back up. And if we look at uh, candidates and we go back to, yeah, back to candidates here, it has this page parameter for paginating through results starting at page one. Uh, this will start to give you a hint of um, how to figure this out is like if we control F for pagged, it'll talk about pages and pagination uh, throughout the descriptions. And um, we'll, go on. we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, another one that I that I found for this is this site, uh, crossref.org. So um, this is uh, a, a site that has like um, cross references uh, of uh, various, I haven't dug into all the details about which um, like journals it has, but it is, you can look things up by different um, references. Uh, and it's got all this stuff in it, but it, it has this, again, pagination section of their documentation. Um, and it says that it uses offsets. It also has another way. So let's go into, oh, this other way is cursor pagination, cursor or token parameter um, pagination. And uh, this crossref.org site, sorry, I had that slide there, but this crossref.org has this deep paging with cursor. Uh, so they, they support this cursor-based pagination. Um, the difference is um, basically, so page, you're saying I want page seven of this result set based on all the other keys that I'm giving you. A cursor is like, it's an ID that the server has of this set of results is cursor number, or the cursor with like this string. And generally what it'll be is they have something that they store on their side that says, oh, when you get this string, show these results. Um, because of that, cursors tend to be uh, transient. Like if you don't use it right away, it'll get wiped out of the database and won't have a meeting anymore. But it also tends to be faster because they have stored those res results. They're like, oh yeah, we know exactly which results you mean when you say that cursor, they don't have to process through your whole query to figure it out. Um, another strategy is uh, what I'm referring to as header link, where there's a, um, in the response you get back separate from the actual like text results, there's a header. And the, the header is just like the, this is what this result is. It's information that normally so far we have totally ignored. JSON light doesn't give us the opportunity to look at it and we haven't had any reason to, but uh, in, in this case, the header can be useful and it can have this link that uh, is specifically go to this URL to get the next set of results. Um, an example of that, the like canonical example is GitHub. Um, it has link headers and it'll tell us in the uh, response, sorry, in the, the header that it'll have this link result. Now I went digging to find uh, another example and I have a typo in my slide in a second here because this, uh, while GitHub is great, you need uh, your own uh, personal access token set up to use the GitHub API. And I don't want to go through how to do that at this moment in the book. And so um, we have a separate one that's probably less useful to a lot of people. And I should say cards, that this is Magic the Gathering cards. And this API uh, uses the link uh, pagination. And so we will look at that as an example a free example, no authentication required. And then the final one that I found while trying to find examples, um, there is another pattern that actually is not yet supported or is not natively supported in header two, but I found a lot of sites that use this other thing that it's basically like the header link, but they send it in the response. So they'll have a parameter that is next URL, something like that in 
the the main res- body of the res- response. Um, <laughs> this is another one that the free version of that. This is this monster list uh, from for D and D, and um, it sends this next uh, argument, and it tells you that if you go to this URL, it'll have the next page of responses. Um, there was also a Disney API, but uh, I didn't want to risk uh, that API disappearing when Disney notices that it's there because it's not an official Disney API. Um, and there are lots of other ones that use this body link. And so um, so uh, Kevin asked in the chat, do APIs generally pa- uh, paginate, paginate, whatever, based on response length? or content size, or both? Like, will there always be a max of X results per page? Most of the time, it's going to be X results per page. And a lot of times, uh, they have an, a parameter uh, per page or page size that tells you um, how many are coming back. And usually there's a maximum on that. So, you know, you can get up to 100 or up to 20 or up to whatever number they choose uh, but you can also vary that below that maximum. Um, basically, uh, once you get into using pagination, it's best to go with whatever page size they tell you to use because, and, and then to not count on that page side size. Um, yeah, so like if you wanted 150 and their maximum is 100, that's where you would have to get two pages of results. You would have to paginate and get that second result. Um, for the most part, I, I really recommend just going with the size that they like or that they want you to use, um, with the caveat that, you know, sometimes something might charge you per request and therefore they might set their page size small if they are jerks so that you're making more requests. And so kind of read the documentation and watch out for that and make it, you know, as large as they will let you make, um, but larger does result in more possibility for errors. So it's a balancing act. A lot of times their default size will be uh, kind of artificially small because if you're just experimenting, they don't want to send you a hundred responses if you just wanted to see if the API works. And so just watch out for that. All right. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I, yes. <laughs> That is a good point that pointing out that watching out for we haven't done anything with paid APIs yet on purpose. Um, I probably have a whole chapter that is just all about when you're paying for an API. These are all the things to watch out for because, um, you know, that's obviously a whole different ball game. All right. And we will see you next week, Kevin. Um, so the next section, how can I determine how an API handles pagination? Well, unfortunately, there isn't like just, oh, go to this section of the docs, like there should be. Um, I went digging, as far as I can tell, it's not even coming in the next version of Open, F- open API uh, specification. There's just no standard on this. Um, and so you like number one, almost always, even if they use these other strategies, they will mention it in the relevant path. And so like, if we look at OpenFEC, um, every path that has a page parameter tells us that it has a page parameter and it says that it's for paginating through results starting at page one and it has a per page and it tells you uh, how many to display per page. Um, and so they mention that in the, uh, for, or the endpoint itself. Often, oops go back to this, there's a separate pagination section near the top of the docs. So for example, on this Crossref um, API, they have this pagination section. And then again, like when we go into the different um, sections there, our different endpoints, um, it will have a thing in here that I should have linked to, yeah pagination with offsets and deep paging within that endpoint. So it it describes it again. So this first one is your your best bet. Um, If they don't specifically tell you, like technically OpenFEC didn't specifically talk about how pagination works, but if you see page per page or cursor parameters, 
those are telling you that it's either the offset style or the cursor style of pagination. Um, if you still can't tell, send one response and just kind of look at it, like go through the header, go through, you know, try to call something that, you know, like, um, it, you know, let's say it's something that it's supposed to be monthly results and it sends you back three results. Probably they have some sort of pagination strategy in that case, you know, that kind of thing. So if the results don't make sense, um, but almost always it's going to be in the path, it'll have an argument that tells you how to paginate one or more arguments. All right. So how do you do it? Um, before we do it, I want to do a little bit about retries. So um, if you are hitting an API, if you're hitting it too often, like most of the time, the API itself is gonna have something in it that says, hey, you have called me a hundred times in the last two seconds. Um, I can't take it. And it'll send you back uh, a response. And so, you know, when you're paginating, you're almost always gonna be doing this. You're gonna be making repeated API calls. Um, and you, you want to be as nice as they want, as they tell you that you need to be <laughs> basically. Um, unfortunately, like the more money that's behind it, uh, the more likely they're both going to tell you how nice they want you to be and, uh, have a very high limit. But if it's, if you're just hitting some guy's API, they might not have something built in to tell you that you're slamming their servers. So just kind of, you know, be aware that you should be nice. Um, if it starts to get really slow, uh, probably stop. <laughs> Things like that. Do a little bit of experimentation. But the best thing you can do is, or the kind of baseline thing you can do is this function rec retry in hitter two. Um, what this function is going to do by default and the, the level that we're going to go into it today is that it will watch for the server to say, hey, stop, because there's a certain type of response that it can send that says, wait and that response if it's set up right will say try again in three seconds or try again in an hour or try again at this specific time um and so rec retry is looking for that type by default it's looking for that type of response and doing what it says to do so if it says to wait three seconds it will automatically wait three seconds something to be careful if you do use this function which again i highly recommend uh you have to set either the max tries or max seconds. Those arguments are like, if if you're told to wait, how many times will you retry before you just give up and throw an error? Um, or max seconds is like, how long are you willing to wait for this response? Either one of those could make sense depending on what you're doing, but you have to set one of those arguments. By default, they're both null. If you set rec retry, but you don't set either of those arguments, um, it, uh, sorry, it will just not apply. It'll, it feels like you set up retries, but it won't retry unless you tell it either how many times to retry or the seconds. Most of the time you can probably set max tries to two because like you'll hit the server and then it will tell you wait until this time. And then you hit the server at that time and it'll work. And so you only need the two replies or two, two tries. Um, I think uh, in most of my most of my examples, I set that to three or four because if something weird happens, I want it to try one more time, but it doesn't need to just keep trying a thousand times. Um, so yeah, we aren't going to go into, so technically there's the, so max seconds is like how long to keep retrying. Separately, there's like how long to wait for a single response. And uh, timeout is like, how long will you wait for one response? I'm putting all of that stuff into its own chapter because there are a whole bunch of things around that. You can set throttling, you can do all these different things. Um, we'll go into those in a separate chapter. Uh, and the other options for rec retry, you can just leave them as is. Again, in that separate chapter, uh, I haven't decided where that is yet, but we'll go into all the other options or you can read them in the documentation. But just setting that up um, using the defaults will work for a lot of APIs. Um, in fact, like all the ones I have tried recently, uh, just have rec retry, they, they implement it right. And so, uh, which is nice because then you don't have to really think about it. You can just 
let it go. And by the way, if you have record retry set and um, they don't implement it right, they don't send back the, hey, try again in 10 seconds or three seconds or whatever, it will just fail, which is you know good. It'll tell you this, it didn't work. My strategy for dealing with it didn't work. Here's the error that I got. Um, and then you can look at the later chapter to see how to deal with that other error. All right. And that takes us to rec perform iterative, which I think we have time to go through one example of, um, and then we'll we'll come back next week and uh, finish it up. So this function rec perform iterative, uh, it is experimental. Oops, I should probably put the slides back up. Sorry, uh, it's experimental. It was added in Hitter two version one, which came out last uh, November or so, um, and. Uh, what it will do is it will replace rec perform. And so instead of using rec perform, you use this rec perform iterative. Um, again, I put a retry in here because um, I want to keep trying if one of my pages fails. Um, and then rec perform iterative, and you tell it a function for how to figure out what the next request, request is going to be, and a maximum request how many pages. Um, to send to to keep going through. Uh, we'll see examples of this that, um, you know, you can set that max request to infinity, and then it'll just keep going until it runs out of pages. Or you can say, well, I only want the first three pages. Um, it depends what you're doing. Like when you're when you're experimenting to see if it'll work. A lot of times you might just want to set max requests to two, uh, and that's how many separate pages it'll do. Um, that uh, function to choose next request, that is, um, or examples of that are iteration helpers that uh, Hitter2 has three iteration helpers for um, figuring out what the next request will be. You can also write your own function, but those three will cover most cases. And um, like I said, there is a fourth case that I found quite a bit. So I'm probably going to pull request that fourth case, but here I'm going to, in the chapter, I show how to hand roll that fourth case. Um, and let's do one helper real quick. Quick. So the most basic um, or the most frequent, I think, style of iteration or of pagination is offset. So iterate with offset is this helper. It has an argument param name, so page or whatever the param might be called. It could be offset. You know, usually it's either page or offset. Um, and then uh, there are start arguments and offset. There's a start argument and an offset argument in iterate with offset. The start argument saying I want to start at page one and the offset is saying I want to increment by one each time. I can't think of a case that I've ever seen um, where like you want to increment by two. I, I guess if you were just like trying to do a sampling of the results, maybe you would want to increment by three or something, but uh, that's, you know, most of the time you'll just want to leave those as is. Um, and then the important part is this argument resp pages, which is a function to convert the response to a count of pages. And so um, what it's going to do is, if we remember there was that max requests argument to iterate, um, sorry, to uh, rec perform iterative, it takes, uh, it updates that max requests option to either be what you set it to or the total number of pages. So it doesn't just keep going after it's out of pages. Um, or sorry, the, the function does that, the function that you're generating is just, how do I find that? How do I find rest pages? Uh, and we'll see an example of that in a second. One thing to note is in the help, it says that this rest pages function is called once. Um, but technically if your function is broken and it fails to find the, um, the number of pages, it will recall that function every, uh, iteration. Um, and so it's not, it's technically not only called once. All right. Um, and then finally, there's another argument, resp complete, which is a function to check if resp is the last page. Um, and 
usually you're not going to need that, but you might need an example like I'm showing here, just shorthand for if there's no response, uh, if there's no body in the response, then uh, we're done. You know, then, then we are out of pages. Again, you probably don't need to actually give this argument, but if it's never stopping, if you don't have a number of pages, then this is the alternative way to do that. And so I'm, I want to show the example, and then we will be done for this this week. So um, this is the open FEC uh, endpoint, and you know this is I, I, this is kind of the just the core of this is the, the request that we're going to be using, where we um, do an API key in election year in an office. And I'm throwing this has raised funds on here because that severely uh, shrinks the size of the number of candidates and makes it something that's kind of accessible um, because lots of people file to run for president and then don't actually do anything with it. All right, um, this is a, the single version. And if we call the single, like like we've been doing in the past, it will always say candidates uh, results is 20, but it has this pagination section <clears throat> in the response. Um, and it gives us a count argument and the count of 173. That is how many pages, um, I'm sorry, that's how many results, total results are available. <clears throat> so, and we can set up this multi, again, where we say retry and perform iterative. We're gonna use iterate with offset. Our argument is called page. And in our response, what we're looking for is pagination and pages. And again, that is just something that we can learn from reading the docs, or more often we'll get that single response and kind of look at it. And we can see that it has this pagination that has a number of pages. So that will tell uh, hitter two how many pages there are. And we're going to tell it to keep going until you run out. So keep going until you hit that number of pages. So max request is infinite. And when we actually call that, it gets nine pages because it's getting 173 total results. So nine pages. Um, we'll go through this more and actually I'll probably re-go through these sections next week so that everyone can see. But that I want to get you that far because with this, you can use most APIs and you can get all the data that you're trying to get. Um, and so uh, we will leave it there. And then next week we will talk about the other ways that you can iterate and the uh, how to actually get the results out of that thing that comes back because uh, this is actually nine separate responses. How do we deal with that? That's a whole separate function. All right. So thank you all very much. Uh, go ahead, Rebecca. I was just going to say thank you, John, as always. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. I look forward to uh, finishing this up next week and then probably, well, we'll see. Either we'll begin authentication or we even, I might just end early to get us back onto a, a nice clean start point. So we'll, we will see how things are going. All right, bye.